My name is Justin Clement. Welcome to another Lunch and Learn talk hosted by the Valley Forge Park Alliance. We have a, a very interesting talk today. I'm sure there are those who scratch their head and we're thinking, why New Orleans? You know, why are we talking about New Orleans uh, at this point in time? Well, I would argue, and most historians argue, that you can't have a, a limited point of view or perspective on which you are just looking at the so-called 13 colonies. I mean, why wasn't it 12? Why wasn't it 14 colonies uh, or 15? East Florida, West Florida, Quebec. You know, we, there are all these other colonies within the British Empire. And of course, New Orleans being part of Louisiana, uh, although it was part of the Spanish Empire at the time, it is part of the United States today. So it is part of US history. And if we look at the American Revolution, and then of course the larger global war that became the, the, the Revolutionary War fought abroad, well, this certainly factors in. So this, this story today, uh, we're going to challenge perhaps uh, the limited perspective that is, is often discussed when looking at this conflict. Now we're joined today by Philippe Halbert. I have known him since uh, our time at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, we were act actually part of a colonial dance program, evening program that there. Uh, at the time, he was a student at the College of William and Mary. He's since gone on to uh, Winterthur, uh, their program in uh, American material culture. And he's currently a doctoral candidate at Yale University's History of Art Department. His dissertation explores the artistic and performative dimensions of Creole identity and self-fashioning in the French Atlantic world before 1800. Uh, he will also hold a dissertation fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania's McNeil Center for Early American Studies uh, this next academic year. So we're very fortunate to have him here today. Uh, and uh, hopefully if he's in the Philadelphia area uh, this next year, we might see a little bit more of him. So at any rate, uh, uh, Philippe Albert, thank you for joining us today. Uh, glad to have you. Well, thanks for the introduction, Justin. Can you hear me okay? Yep, coming through loud and clear. Great. Well, thanks again, Justin. Thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit about a place that I kind of fell in love with uh, a little circuitously, but have been going to, I can't say every year now for the past whatever years, because I haven't been in almost two years, but I used to be in New Orleans quite a lot. Um, and I've come to kind of come to know the place and, and really just fallen into the history with, uh, well, just really, really gotten into it. The more I get into this, the more interesting it becomes. And for reasons like you just mentioned, this is sort of a a sideline story, um, if it's included at all. And, and so I really, um, again, thanks for the opportunity to share this today. And I look forward to any questions or comments at the end or as we, as we go through. But uh, just a, a quick word on my, uh, on my choice of words. So my title for this talk is Revolutionary New Orleans, A Borderlands Town Goes to War. So uh, I put 1776, I kind of wish I had started in 68 and I'll explain why in a minute. And I go up to 84 and I'll explain that uh, at the end of the talk. But just a quick note on vocabulary. So borderland, borderlands, what does that mean? And just as a really quick introduction, survey, overview of that term, um, I, I'm, I'm quoting here from um, Pekka Hamelainen and Benjamin Johnson talking about a borderland as a place where no single group rules kind of supreme, where there's no necessarily obvious line of sovereignty, uh, places that exist between the colonial and the indigenous, literate, non-literate. And that's very much New Orleans. And, and I'll show a, a map that will, be, that will make that a little bit more clear. Um, but, but New Orleans and the Gulf South really kind of occupies this kind of liminal zone in our own collective consciousness, but also historically it was somewhat the case as well. And uh, I want to just plug and nod to the work of Kathleen Duval, whose work, whose book you see at right, um, got a great New York Times book review. review. Um, but this is a really readable, um, very much written for a public audience, um, but so deep and so rich. And she's really put together a very kind of cohesive narrative and survey of the War of Independence in this other theater, as it were. So, um, please, without taking too much away from her thunder, um, do check out the book and I'll be really scratching the surface today, but hopefully get you, if you don't already know her work, do check it out because it's a great book. Um, and then secondly, the word Creole, which um, I'm not going to actually use so much in this talk, but I think it's just important to sort of put it out there. 
Um, in its most basic 18th century sense, Creole refers to um, a person or a thing that is born in a place to which it is not native. That sounds kind of complicated, but here's a French dictionary from 1768, uh, a natural history dictionary that, de that defines Creole as um, the name given to all persons born in America, which from the French perspective could mean the Caribbean, it could mean North America. Um, Creole is also used for people living in these, West, uh, in these uh, Indian Ocean colonies as well. Um, and so basically it's not about race as much as it is place of birth and culture. Um, it doesn't have to do specifically with racial mixture, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, the intersections and the legacies of race and slavery in New Orleans specifically um, in this talk. But, but Creole is a word that kind of uh, can cause some arguments and, and sometimes means different things in different places. But just as a kind of disclaimer, having said that, I want to also just do a really quick overview of the world of, uh, in which we're talking about. So you see New Orleans here on the left. I didn't make this map. So for whatever reason, New Orleans doesn't show up in this map, but it's still here in 1763. But uh, New Orleans is part of a much larger world, uh, a much larger French imperial world that is created in or claimed beginning in the 16th century. And um, New France, which is claimed in the 1530s, permanently settled in the 17th century. Uh, Quebec is the imperial capital founded in 1608. And uh, New Orleans is kind of uh, late to the game. It's founded in 1718. It's the third colonial capital of Louisiana, which is the lower, the Southern half of New France and uh, Louisiana, which is claimed in 1682, but it's not settled until, uh, permanently settled until the turn of the 18th century. The first capital is Mobile, what's now in Alabama. The second capital, Biloxi, now in Mississippi. And the third capital and the longest serving capital uh, for the colonial period is New Orleans. So as you can see at the end of the French and Indian War, the Seven Years War, the tables turn and France has effectively left North America, the continent anyway, and Louisiana has become Spanish. And this was a little circuitous as well. Uh, in 1762, Louis XV secretly cedes Louisiana to the King of Spain, who was his cousin, Carlos III. In 1763 in Paris, this is not necessarily um, appreciated by the British. And so there's some discussion as to how we can more equitably display or uh, disperse and, and, and share this territory. And what they decide is that all the territory west of the Mississippi will go to Spain, along with New Orleans and the Isle of Orleans, which is what that little area is called under the lake. Um, and everything east of the Mississippi will go to Britain. And so this is how Florida for a few years becomes British, uh, had been, been Spanish before, and it's divided into two colonies, East and West Florida. So the panhandle basically, um, and then the, the little tip that goes into the, the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, in 1776, um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the British, but just as a, again, as a kind of uh, my own little soapbox, in 1776, there are more than 13 mainland North American colonies in the British Empire. There's also Jamaica, there's also, there are also the Bahamas. So not even counting uh, these Caribbean islands on the mainland, you have East and West Florida, you have the province of Quebec, formerly Canada, New France, uh, and you also have New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, uh, both of which have actually been British since the 17 teens. Um, so when we say 13 colonies, I think it's important to sort of be specific. Which ones are we talking about? And Kathleen Duval talks about this in her own book about why the Floridas don't rebel. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that at the end. Um, but but these, these colonies don't rebel. And uh, it, it sort of brings New Orleans into the picture and sort of strengthens its own importance uh, in the narrative that, that I'll be talking about today. So for all intents and purposes, though, we're talking about Louisiana, New Orleans. It's a Spanish colony by this point and uh, will remain so until secret treaty in 1800. And then 1803 when France, which has reacquired Louisiana, sells it to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. So having said that, so a place in time, New Orleans, what does New Orleans look like in this 18th century eve of American independence kind of moment? So. New Orleans is founded in 1718, and it's not necessarily a very desirable post for government officials and military officers and the like who are 
stationed or posted there, but um, it, it's sort of undeveloped for a good, a good part of its 18th century iteration. Um, it's never fortified, um, at least not until 1760. So you have all these maps that you'll see of New Orleans with these fortifications from the French period that are very much basically fantasies. And when the king and his ministers find out that this is all basically a farce, they get really upset. And it takes the fall of Quebec in 1759 for New Orleans to erect some sort of fortification. Um, this is a garrison town. It has a very military character under both the French and the Spanish, but there are no real fortifications to boast of until 1760. So this is a map by a British officer posted uh, to Mobile. And here you can see that the French have taken this seriously. The, the fall of New France is imminent. It's basically already happened. And uh, in 1760, by the end of the year, these ramparts and fortifications, all wood, as well as some moats have been created and more barracks as well. Um, they never see any action because in 1763, right, Louisiana, 62 technically, but by 63, this is a Spanish colony. Um, and, and what I wanted to do sort of uh, before getting into the revolutionary period again is to just give you kind of a sense of this place in time. So this is very much a sort of enlightenment plan. Um, ironic because we're in the middle kind of on the edge of a swamp in a not so great climate. But you can see with this grid, there is this idea of order and control, even if the inhabitants don't necessarily hew to that. Um, we're looking at a population in this period of about 3,000 people, um, roughly uh, a little bit of a, a slight white minority, uh, about 300 or so free people of color, and about 1,000, a little bit over 1,100 enslaved African people. So um, for the most part, it's, it's split almost 50-50, and it depends on the census, but for the most part, um, it, it looks like there's a, a slight white majority, but you have to remember that outside of New Orleans are these plantations that are founded and established along this winding Mississippi River. So there is a large enslaved population that, that certainly characterizes this as, if not a slave society, a society with enslaved people. So having said that, uh, just a few kind of fun quotes from visitors to New Orleans at this time. So this is a French visitor in uh, at the turn of the French to Spanish regimes. Uh, talking about the harbor of New Orleans being wide and commodious. Um, I'm not sure what he's talking about when he says the streets are clean and broad, because there are a lot of other contemporary accounts talking about how the streets are mud, there's trash and pollution, and they have to put down boards to make sure they don't get wet. Um, so this is a place that is built on high ground. It's not that high. It's only a few feet above sea level, but there was a method to the madness in choosing this kind of raised... Um, position, raised being very relative here, but this was also a place that indigenous people had been coming to for centuries for diplomacy and for trade and other events. Um, so it is, it is high ground, but again, that height is relative. Um, when this French visitor, Beges, talks about the uh, extremely handsome buildings, however, uh, he might have been referring to something like this, which is the oldest colonial era the oldest building you can see above ground in New Orleans, the Ursuline Convent, which was uh, designed in the mid 1740s and completed by 1753. Uh, it's a, a masonry building with a stucco facade, um, very much a kind of Norman French building just kind of plopped down in New Orleans. Uh, not necessarily characteristic of people's homes or what you would have seen in New Orleans uh, for, for everybody else, but the Ursuline sisters were uh, an important force in the town. They were teachers, they were uh, nurses, and they sought the education specifically of women um, across the color line. And so uh, it, it is a kind of different place um, compared to, for example, Boston or Philadelphia or New York. And uh, I just know that this is actually today the front. Uh, in the 18th century, the front was on the other side facing the river, which was a little bit closer than it is today. But you can see we're just just at where the crescent kind of starts here uh, in, in this part of the French Quarter, the original, uh, the original New Orleans. Yeah, and of course, uh, St. Ursula's Convent uh, in uh, Quebec City uh, is uh, uh, also there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you can uh, visit uh, uh, Quebec City today and, uh, and, and find uh, essentially the sister institution there. 
Um, my favorite bed and breakfast is actually uh, hosted in part of that building. So <laughs> if anyone ever goes up that way. <laughs> and this is open as a museum too, so you can still go and visit it today. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, definitely speaks to kind of these shared cultural ties. And I didn't even say this, but New Orleans is founded by, um, well, we say founded by the French, but a group of French people or French speaking people led by a Montrealer. So there's this kind of cultural affinity between Canada and the Gulf South, not just Louisiana, but Alabama, Mississippi as well. Um, even Texas, you know, you have French and Canadians who are coming there visiting, if not permanently settling. So it, it really makes for an interesting story when you sort of expand your framework and your perspective beyond just the, the more kind of canonical stuff that we usually get in, in school. Um, so this is, again, the only really French colonial building that survives in its French colonial iteration. This, this chapel is a 19th century edition, so just erase that from your mind. In terms of what happens when Spain takes over, though, there is a kind of a more forced infrastructural campaign, and that includes instituting um, a municipal government known as a cabildo. Um, the cabildo is what the governing body is called. The actual structure would be called the Casa Capitular. Um, but this is Jackson Square, so an iconic space. Uh, and I like to always ask if people have visited New Orleans, and I like to count the, the hands that are raised. It gives me a good, a good baseline. I'm just going to assume that many of you are familiar with this, but this was, as you can see, underwent different uh, renaming campaigns. So Place of Arms, which also speaks to this military ethos in a way that, that reigns in these, what are in a way sort of little outposts um, that are removed, that are uh, difficult to get to that are cut off from a lot of other places because of hurricanes and floods, uncooperative weather, um, and also people's desire to be somewhere else. Because when you could be anywhere else but a mosquito swamp, uh, you know, with snakes and alligators and things even in the streets sometimes, um, you can understand maybe the, the reaction. But um, the two buildings on either side, the Cabildo, so the, the government house basically, uh, or the municipal government, um, and then the, uh, the, the priory at right for the Capuchin friars. Those are both very late 1790s buildings. And then the Cathedral of St. Louis or St. Saint Louis, um, which is founded as a parish church and elevated to a cathedral in the 1790s. Uh, the cathedral is a, a mid-19th a mid century building, but I include it here just to give you a sense of the kind of, you know, the arms of power here. We have the, the government and we have the church and the government is a monarchy. And so it raises the question of why should these people care at all about the independence of some sort of troublesome Anglo-American Protestants, um, you know, who are fighting to rid themselves of what is otherwise a kind of divinely ordained royal power over them. Uh, and, and so you can see there's a shift as we get through the 18th century, but also people are very pragmatic. And if it means keeping their own uh, interests at heart, uh, that then you might, you can understand it a little bit. So, um, so Jackson Square, a, a place, a parade ground, um, a market, a place for executions and public tortures, um, but this is right at the center of town. And so you can see that that, that grid plan um, and that kind of this desire for order and control manifests not only in the plan of the city, but also in the placement of these different um, organs of power, um, as it were. So in terms of what it looks like to live in New Orleans, um, this is the same French gentleman, Beges, uh, in the 1760s talking about the houses being tolerably pleasant. Um, he talks here about them being raised up off the ground. And these two examples are not, but I'll show you in a second what that looks like. But I wanted to just note the comments he talks about with these houses being placed kind of next to a piece of water, you know, a little kind of pond or something in the middle of what he calls a little plantation. Um, I think this is a great evocation of what many other visitors to New Orleans and the archaeological record bear out, which is that New Orleans in the 18th century resembles kind of a village. Um, the lots are big. People have animals and they have ornamental and utilitarian gardens in, on their plots. And uh, so it's not this kind of densely packed urban space, the way we think of a city, the way we might think of Philadelphia, for example, at the same time. Um, this is a smaller place, again, a population of around 3,000 or so um, in the 1770s, 5,000 by the mid-1780s. But these two early houses, which again are, are good examples of what this place kind of looked like. And the reason why I don't have more to show you 
is because in 1788, um, a huge fire went through New Orleans that, that took out about three quarters of the town. Another fire took place in 1794. It's a very flammable city, but it's a lot of wooden architecture. And so these are some of the more kind of permanent style buildings, which are brick between post, not impervious to fire, but um, compared to the other buildings, which were often post in the ground or uh, frame buildings with a kind of mud and moss mixture to fill between the uh, the post, you can understand how you have a, a stray candle and it just all goes up in flames. And uh, that's exactly what happened in 1788. But these are two, two examples from around the time of the American Revolution. One at right moved into town about 1780 from a, a nearby plantation. And then the one at left, uh, which is now a famous, very popular bar, um, has nothing to do with Lafitte, the pirate, but uh, that's the name. And uh, it is a really cool little building. It gets, it gets a beating, but um, maybe the past year it's had something of a break. But um, also interesting because you can see there's this Caribbean influence on the right with those overhanging uh, pitched roof that kind of takes the water off. And then to the left, what you can see in Canada and Normandy with this more steeply pitched roof. Um, so there's this kind of Creole fusion in terms of architecture as well. Um, this plays out in food, it plays out in clothing, it plays out in language as well. So um, in terms of the raised house, this is one of my favorites. This is one of the um, other older houses in town built probably in the, during the French period, but substantially uh, rebuilt in the wake of that 1788 fire. So this is one of those raised Creole houses, very, uh, very Caribbean in feel. And um, again, I'm, I'm just going to quote from Peges again, where he talks about uh, what's known as a gallery or a galerie in French, which is this, um, I think I have a cursor. Yeah. So this is this space right here, which doubles as a kind of semi-outdoor living space. And we have records of people sleeping on these spaces, eating, entertaining. Um, and this is, um, so this is a house that's just around the corner from the square. Um, just in terms of a place and time to think that showing you these houses, you know, they look different. People are speaking different languages in them. They're practicing a different religion um, in their homes and in, in their churches. But there are other things that are very similar and, and kind of cut across time and space. So for example, this site was the site of a tavern that was in operation from the 1730s until the 1770s, operated by this woman, Elisabeth Rial, who was a French woman who came to New Orleans, uh, Louisiana anyway, in the 17 teens, uh, was widowed twice, but she ran this business. Also, she was married to smugglers. So you can see there are these kind of, um, the, these trends that, that are very much um, in evidence in all kinds of colonial American ports. And there's been a lot of really great archeology span at the site rather that has um, unearthed some examples of uh, serving wares that were either uh, owned and used by her in her own home um, or in her business or in this house, which was actually occupied by a Spanish officer who had served um, at the Battle of Mobile um, during the revolution. So there's actually a, a Revolutionary War plaque right on the, the little the base down there. But um, I'm not going to get too much into him, but just to give you a sense that, you know, these are places where people are coming and discussing trade. They're discussing war. They're discussing politics. It's the same thing. Um, across the board, and especially along the eastern seaboard, where I know many of you are familiar with, with taverns as spaces in which to, to, to discuss and to share news. So in that respect, uh, you know, this would fit very well into kind of the greater theme of transatlantic history. You know, the idea of the transatlantic world, uh, would that be safe to say that, uh, you know, I mean, it's a Certainly a seaport town, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a seaport. I mean, you have people coming and going from the Caribbean. There's a lot of um, interaction actually between New Orleans and Philadelphia in this period, but um, I'm, I'm not showing it here. I'm showing tinglazed French earthenware to just kind of make the point that things do stay somewhat French, but we find a lot of creamware archaeologically, um, which is not what you would expect to find at a French colonial site. But in New Orleans, circa 1780, you're finding French faience, um, English creamware, uh, German stoneware. And so this sort of reflects that coming together. Uh, Native American pottery has been found at this site as well. We know that there's a market around the corner that indigenous people are coming and selling pottery and game and firewood at. So it's a really interesting uh, kind of fusion of all these different peoples coming from 
places near and far, basically. So just because I can't help myself. So I am a, a decorative arts person in a way. And so to make the point that, uh, you know, the material culture of the place bears witness to a continued French presence or French cultural um, presence, even if that's slightly tempered over the decades. But the furniture, in terms of what survives, still stays pretty French, um, but also speaks to connections between New Orleans and the Caribbean. So this armoire, which is a very kind of um, typical French form, and just I enjoy that, um, you know, this is something that you see into the 19th century. You even see Louisiana newspapers in the 19th century talk about armors like armoire, but it's an English language newspaper. And they're talking about this wardrobe form that is used because these houses don't have closets. They don't have central hallways even. And so this is basically the storage for clothing and serving wares and the like. Um, so that's made from walnut and cypress, which is a local wood, whereas a little table at left is made from mahogany, which would have had to come from probably Saint-Domingue, Haiti, somewhere in the Caribbean, um, and speaks to the persistence of that French Rococo form, but a material that is innately new world, doesn't grow though in Louisiana, has to come from somewhere else, could very well have been smuggled in from a British colony like Jamaica. Um, and, and it's just, it's a really rich um, legacy, even in spite of the fact that a fire took out probably most of the colonial era stuff we might have otherwise had to look at. So Again, uh, you know, just don't leave candles burning at home. <laughs> when you're not home, it, it can really just think of the future, basically. We do have a question. Uh, yeah. If had quotes uh, come up a few times, is it uh, Francois LePage? Yeah, uh, it's... It was, uh, that's a, a travel narrative, uh, essentially, that he published. Uh, can you talk a little bit about him? Um, yeah, so he's an interesting guy. Um, he's traveling between 1767 and I think 69 or 70. He's going from France all the way to the Philippines. Um, but the first place he goes is the Caribbean. And from there, he goes into Louisiana. He goes up the Mississippi into more rural parishes, um, what we call counties today, uh, or would call counties in another place. Yeah. And this is published in English and in French, and um, I, I'm just using the English translation for this, which is more or less faithful, but, but has a good 18th century flair. So having said that, and talking about the French and French culture, um, I want to shift into the kind of more historical revolutionary stuff. So um, in 1766, Louisiana gets its first Spanish governor, um, Antonio de Ulloa, who is not very popular. Uh, he, he arrives with his wife, she's Peruvian, and um, I don't, they don't even go to New Orleans. They stay at a, a local fort at the mouth, of the, um, the mouth of the Mississippi. And so the people of New Orleans feel slighted. They also don't really necessarily accept Spanish sovereignty. And so in 1768, there's this contingent of Creole, so colonial born and also French immigrant merchants, planters, who also coincidentally um, are, um, members of the superior council, so the French precedent to the cabildo, the local government, the, the colonial court. And they basically rile everybody up and they march through the streets of New Orleans and they're shouting all kinds of things like, we don't want um, Spanish wine, Catalonian rot gut is what they say. And um, it gets pretty heated. And so um, Ulloa basically flees New Louisiana and, and never actually takes formal ownership of the colony in a way that the local people accept. And so it's about a dozen or so of these Creole conspirators. Um, this is 1768. In 1769, um, this gentleman, Alejandro O'Reilly, who is an Irish-born um, descendant of a Jacobite officer, he is in the service in the pay of Spain, and he arrives with a force of about 2,000 Spanish troops from Havana, and his mission is to just take charge of the colony and just put this to bed. And um, O'Reilly, who is nicknamed Bloody O'Reilly um, by, by the local population, um, he's not really necessarily that, that violent or extreme, but he is, he rules with an iron fist when it comes to these Creole conspirators, um, half of whom are deported uh, and imprisoned in Havana. Um, the more, um, the, the guiltier ones <laughs> are, the more high profile ones are executed by firing squad in New Orleans uh, in 1769. And so this gives rise to a much larger mythology of uh, Creole French culture 
um, in, in Louisiana and in New Orleans in particular, um, in the 1830s, there's a play that's performed in New Orleans that's called the, uh, the Patriot Martyrs. Um, it's a very romantic um, kind of thing, but you know you have to think this is 1769, and this is not even a this is not even a whole year before the Boston Massacre, where people are also being shot by you know invading troops, as it were. And so the the, the similarities are kind of uncanny um, in that respect. Um, and O'Reilly is really bent on instilling in Louisiana is the sense that you are now subjects of the King of Spain. And so he puts forth a bunch of proclamations. This is one of them, which is forbidding um, interactions between Louisianans and foreigners to include people from the Caribbean, um, uh, other possible French people, basically to really just kind of instill in them the sense that this is now a Spanish colony and they need to adhere and, and, and act accordingly. Um, but um, O'Reilly is, is, is the governor responsible for a number of things. He institutes, um, he puts together the Cabildo. He also creates the fixed Louisiana regiment. And that is a, um, a kind of local defense. It's not, it doesn't move um, from colony to colony, but it's, com it's comprised of um, a, uh, a fusilier company and, um, I'm sorry, um, a grenadier company and eight fusilier companies. And um, they have their own uniform. And um, in a way, ironically enough, having quelled this rebellion, many of these Frenchmen who were military officers under the French regime, this is a very kind of military culture. Um, ironically enough, uh, these guys are pretty pragmatic and they kind of bolt and they jump at the opportunity to rise the ranks within the fixed regiment. Um, as well as other regiments and units that are created kind of to play to their egos. There's a Dragoon unit, there's, um, there's a Carabiner unit. Um, they all have very flashy, fancy uniforms. And this is a quote from 1802, um, the end of the regime, the Spanish regime, but, but certainly holds true for the earlier period about the men. Uh, nothing pleases them more than the military uniform, which they begin to wear as teenagers, which is also what was happening under the French. And just by way of example, you have an, uh, a portrait by an itinerant Mexican artist who was working in Louisiana, in New Orleans, in the, the 1780s and 90s, uh, until he died in 1802, of this kind of white colored, it's, it looks a little green in the, in the portrait, but it's a white uniform with a kind of navy blue um, turned down collar and cuffs and then uh, waistcoat and breeches in the same color with a cockade. In this case, this is a 1790 or so portrait, but a cockade that speaks to the French and the Spanish alliance that, that comes about um, both politically during the revolution, but also this is a Frenchman who was immigrated to Louisiana. Um, and so he has his own cultural affinity, despite finding fame and fortune in Spanish Louisiana, where he becomes the commandant um, of the Arkansas Post in the 1780s. So this leads us into the, the actual War of Independence period. And, and so what's going on? And uh, this map, uh, it shows 1779 because that's the year that Spain formally enters the war, um, not as an ally of the United States or the colonies, but as an ally of France. And so um, you'll see a lot of historians talk about um, an Anglo-Spanish war because technically that's what they're engaged in. They're not engaged in a fight for freedom. Um, they are, however, under the table helping this American cause for liberty. So this is 1779, but if we take it back to 1776, there is an Irishman, Oliver Pollock, who is living in New Orleans. He's from Ireland, but has arrived via Philadelphia. And he is in league with the Spanish governor working to send gunpowder and shoes and tents and uniforms and other supplies up the Mississippi and then hanging a right at the Ohio and bringing in supplies to Washington and company um, through the back door, basically. And so it's this kind of secret collusion um, between Pollock, who in 1777 is named by the Continental Congress as kind of their agent in New Orleans. Um, Pollock amasses huge debt, but, but he is certainly um, into the cause. He's also an Irishman. He's married to an Irish woman that he met in Havana. Uh, who's living with him in New Orleans, um, with whom he has several children. So you can imagine maybe what is what is inspiring this kind of this kind of activity. But um, Pollock continues to uh, fund and supply 
um, the Continental Army through uh, through the war, basically, um, and continues, especially under the, the with the support of Bernardo de Galvez, who is the governor of Louisiana, arrives in 1770. Um, so um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Um, so one question uh, was uh, how large uh, the overall population of New Orleans. Um, similarly, people are wondering how that compares to Philadelphia population. It's definitely a smaller place. I don't know off the top of my head what Philadelphia's numbers are. Um, Louisiana in about 1780, I know, is like 30 or so thousand people, but that's a huge expanse. New Orleans itself is something like 31, 3,300 um, with about, um, I think it's like 1,100 enslaved people, about 2,000 whites, and then it's about 500 or so free people of color. Yeah. Uh, I believe in 1776, Philadelphia had about 30,000 residents, making it the largest city in the 13 rebellious colonies. Uh, the next largest cities were New York at 25,000 people, Boston at 15,000, Charleston, South Carolina at 12,000 people. So if you compare that to the Continental Army in December 1777, when they marched into the winter encampment, the army included over 19,000 soldiers making Valley Forge the third largest city in the United States for several months. That's uh, amazing because it's 30,000 people for Louisiana, which at this time stretches from the Gulf Coast to like St. Louis, basically. I mean, that's one city versus this whole territory. And we're not including Na Native Americans, right? But still, I mean, that's... We'll just um, get, back to, um, get back to Galvez, who I was talking about as a, this very dynamic figure. Um, he is recruiting actively um, for men to fight um, after uh, war is declared formally between Spain and Britain. So, um, and as I mentioned, um, Spain does not enter on the side of the colonies, but rather uh, as an ally of France for a number of reasons. And so this is the Anglo-Spanish War as it transpires in the Gulf South. Um, let's see. So... Um, basically, in 1779, uh, Galvez is given a green light, and he's told to basically do what you can to annoy, bother, pester the British, but if you can get Florida back, then do whatever you can. And so in 1779, in the summer, um, this kind of almost two-year campaign starts, and it starts in New Orleans, travels up the Mississippi, goes to Baton Rouge, uh, where there is um, uh, a British fort, and um, this is taken by a group under the, by an army that is raised by Galvez. And it's a culturally, racially mixed, um, linguistically mixed group. Um, here's just a modern painting that I think does a nice job of sort of summing up what it looks like to march through Louisiana in the summer with cannon and everything else, because this is an army. It's about 1,400 men, um, some of whom join as the army goes up the river road up the Mississippi to Baton Rouge. Um, but it's a, a mixed group. It's um, um, members of the fixed regiment. It's um, Native American allies. It's um, members of the free black militia. Um, you have Acadians. So these are people who were expelled from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick um, in the 1750s and 60s, um, found their way to Louisiana who also have a bone to pick with the British. And so it's a really interesting I don't want to use the word motley, but it really is a kind of very, in a way, pan-American group. Um, and also there are 13 or so rebellious Americans who are there with Oliver Pollock. So again, this financier, um, this Anglo-American financier, Irishman working in, in New Orleans. But let me go back really quick. They go up to Natchez, what's now in Mississippi, um, and they take that as well. So in 1779, basically, um, with the exception of Mobile, which is taken in 1780, um, it's looking like Spain is on the rise in the lower Mississippi Valley. Uh, Mobile is taken in 1780, and Pensacola is taken in 1781. And I'll get to, to Pensacola in just a second, but just to give you a sense of who is a member of these campaigns. So a number of interesting figures, and um, for example, this Creole officer, um, Favreau, Favreau in French, um, who uh, born in New Orleans in the 1740s and is uh, left to take charge as commandant of Baton Rouge. Um, this is a portrait by the same Mexican artist who painted the other French officer, French-born Spanish officer. 
And um, he is the commandant of, of Baton Rouge for a little bit before then taking on Mobile after that's taken by, by the Spanish. And so you can see there are a number of improvements taken at these really kind of actually kind of motley ragtag posts along the Mississippi. Um, so here you see some Spanish improvements to the post of Baton Rouge, which um, renamed Fort San Carlos. Um, and by the 17, late 1780s, there are about 600 people living here. Um, so you can see this kind of Spanish eye for infrastructure um, uh, holds true even in these kinds of um, much smaller, comparatively smaller places. Also to come out of this um, Baton Rouge campaign, this is a really interesting um, little anecdote that I just wanted to share. Um, but in the uh, late 1779, uh, well, actually in 1778, there is this woman, Agnès Mathieu, who is a, an enslaved African woman born around 1759. And in Spanish Louisiana, there was a law in which you could purchase your freedom as an enslaved person if you had the money. And uh, basically, uh, the person holding you in bondage was obligated to respect that right, that, um, that law. So Agnès Mathieu is enslaved by this woman, Madame Aron, um, who doesn't want to free her, basically. She has all the money and she keeps saying no. And in 1779, um, Galvez signs this woman's basically emancipation papers. Um, and it's in favor of a, an artilleryman who uh, basically uh, seems to have been in a relationship with this woman, a guy by the name of... Um, Mathieu de Vaux, also known as Platy, um, that was one of his nicknames. And so it's not entirely clear what their relationship was, Galvez and this man de Vaux. But um, Galvez also had, uh, you know, as governor, he was also a commander of the military forces, but he was also a governor. And so this is happening in 1779. Galvez signs this woman's freedom papers um, in the wake of the taking of Baton Rouge. And this woman goes off and lives with one of the uh, artillerymen who had fought at that that during that campaign. So um, again, it's just interesting to think that I don't have a lot of stories about women right now because they are really they're rather hard to find. But to think that this kind of um, a manumission case is being heard before the governor in the wake of a really important campaign goes to show that there's a lot going on in this place. Um, and uh, Agnes Mathieu and her French um, common law husband possibly, um, go on to have six or seven children. And um, uh, their great grandson is Homer Plessy. So like Plessy versus Ferguson. So you can see worlds collide, you know, in the span of a hundred years or so in this place. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's like a little, a little nugget that just like blows your mind. Um, and so another, another figure who's a really interesting um, historical character is this guy, Noel Carrier, who was born into slavery in the mid 1740s, south of New Orleans. And there's a great um, historian of slavery and free people of color, Emily Clark at Tulane. And she's coming out with a book soon about this, um, this guy um, who was uh, born enslaved, but bought his freedom and became a member of the, the free black militia um, in 1770. Uh, in New Orleans, and then fought at Baton Rouge, fought at Mobile, um, and fought at Pensacola, was given um, medals of honor by Galvez. Um, uh, I should add that the, these black, these free black militias were, uh, service was compulsory for all able-bodied men, um, black or white. And so again, it makes for a very different look when you are disembarking at New Orleans from a place like, say, Williamsburg or Philadelphia or Boston to see armed free men of color marching around, drilling, um, and then engaging in these kinds of campaigns when uh, in Virginia, for example, it was illegal for enslaved men to, uh, to carry firearms. Uh, and, and so this, um, this makes for really kind of turns that narrative on its head. Derrière started as a, as a um, cooper and a tanner, but he rises the ranks. He's made a captain in the militia and he's present at a lot of baptisms and weddings as a witness. Um, he's very much, he's very faithful to the, the Catholic Church and, uh, and is a, a, a social presence in New Orleans, as well as has this, this amazing track record, this amazing record of service um, in the cause of independence for America, as it were.
So um, just wanted to wrap things up with um, the, the taking of Pensacola, which happens in 1781. This happens um, right before Yorktown and uh, makes for uh, a really interesting turn of events because basically the taking of Pensacola means that Britain no longer has um, any bases along the Gulf Coast. And um, it, it leaves them in a kind of precarious position because they need to get things up to the, the southern front for the War of Independence, um, but they also need to make sure that Jamaica is safe. And so Galvez, after the taking of Pensacola, there are plans actually to take Jamaica, which don't materialize because the Treaty of Paris of 1783 is signed and uh, there's a cessation to the hostilities. Um, but I should add too, part of what um, prompts Galvez to act with such um, you know, force basically in 1779 is that he intercepts intelligence between uh, Britain and the commandant at Mobile in which he is given the order. This is John Campbell, General Campbell, is instructed to take New Orleans in 1779 and again in 1780. So it could have been a completely different thing where New Orleans could have been a British colonial town, it could have been French and Spanish and then British, but um, not the way it worked out. But um, Galvez has this amazing victory at, at Pensacola. Another Spanish officer goes around and um, is in the Bahamas. Um, uh, winning these campaigns as well. And so again, it makes for a very different kind of series of events when we, we shift our gaze to this part of uh, the Americas. And I lied, I have one last slide. So I wanted just to nod also to what is going on with other people living in the region. And this is something that Kathleen Duval really does a great job talking about. Um, you know, what, what does it mean to uh, be a, a Native American person during these conflicts in which you're not invited to the Treaty of Paris. You are, um, you know, you're not seen necessarily as an equal, but um, but these are these are very pragmatic people. And so, 1784, um, I mentioned, was the, the the terminus for this presentation. That's the the year that the Treaty of Pensacola is signed by now Spanish colonial officials from former West Florida um, and Louisiana. So the governor of Louisiana goes to Pensacola and they sign this treaty with the Creek who had been um, allied with the British. And basically this was a treaty in which um, Spain and the Creek promised to end hostilities between themselves um, because now there is this United States and they're pretty hungry for land. Um, and, and it goes to show why do these people living in East and West Florida, indigenous as much as colonial not go for independence? Well, a number of reasons they didn't have local manufacturers, uh, they didn't have this local production of goods, but they also had British law and protection of property and sovereignty in a way that the United States was not going to honor. And so um, this is a, an example of just the continued diplomatic relationships between Spain and these First Nations people in the Southeast who are being given these medals and they're being given honorific, honorary commissions in the Spanish army. Um, and, and it leads to some kind of reworking of these indigenous polities in ways that didn't exist before. So you have the Creek um, and the Choctaw and the Cherokee who are coming together. And this has never happened before, but how can they create this kind of pan-Indian alliance that then in the 1830s is completely obliterated with um, forced removal to places like Oklahoma? So there's a lot going on in this region. And um, this was a very kind of quick overview, but um, I just wanted to, I'll end with that. So that's my contact information and a, a nice view of New Orleans, where if we, again, if we shift our gaze to the South, these stories and the people that can come out of these narratives are really pretty striking. And I, I just want to end on a high note and, and say that I hope, number one, that you enjoyed this talk um, and thanks for your attention, but also I hope that in the coming years, as we sort of turn our gaze to the 250th of the American Revolution, that we can sort of think of ways to engage more critically with this history. How can we bring this into textbooks? How can we bring this into a greater collective consciousness? Because it really does, it speaks to a different American history. It speaks to different American identities. Um, but especially in our day and age today, I think, you know, we, this is what we have to be doing because it just, it's, it, it really kind of, it makes you rethink what you think you already know. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been an excellent presentation. Uh, we would like to open it up to, to questions. 
Uh, I want to start off by uh, mentioning uh, the Bucks of America. Uh, have you um, heard of uh, these folks? Uh, I, I think it was a voluntary uh, independent company, essentially a, a militia company of uh, free black men in Boston uh, during the revolution. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it uh, it's, would be a bit different from the New Orleans situation in which, uh, well, militia companies are always compulsory, you know, able-bodied men between the ages of 16 and 50, usually with a militia acts uh, within, um, you know, uh, British America. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the, the Bucks of America, this, this group of free black men that banded together in Boston, hmm. uh, you know, was a very patriotic way of uh, displaying, uh, you know, their support for this new burgeoning United States. So the question is, um, with black militia companies, do you see a similar uh, uh, pattern in New Orleans uh, where this was an opportunity to establish their um, allegiance to uh, to Spain, essentially? Definitely. I mean, this is a way, if you're rewarded with a silver medal from none other than Galvez, it's a great honor. And I think it's as much to do with sort of maybe an abstract concept of sovereignty and, and allegiance to a, you know, a king whose image is displayed in New Orleans prominently in people's homes and in public buildings. But it's also, I think, a way, thanks. It's also a way to... Um, it's also a way to kind of assert yourself in this local military elite of, um, of free men of color. Um, it's a way to distinguish yourself from, um, you know, other enslaved people. And I, I didn't mention this, but um, Carrier, the, the gentleman who um, was given the medal by Galvez, he was also a slave owner. Um, ironically enough, he enslaved two people before he was freed himself um, in 1770. He was also like, I think, still a teenager at the time. Um, and so, and he's engaged in the slave trade, you know, the domestic, local transactions, you know, all of his life and um, makes for a really kind of paradoxical thing. But this, uh, this group of free people of color who range in um, eliteness, if that's a word, I mean, they're always going to be second class people. Um, but some of them do accumulate a good amount of money and capital. Um, in fact, a lot of now the French Quarter, then New Orleans, a lot of the, the real estate was owned by free women of color um, because also women can own property under these French and Spanish laws in a way that they can't, um, at least not as um, married women in the Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American tradition. So I think it's a way to sort of do both. Hmm. So uh, we have another question. Uh, how directly involved was Washington with uh, these... Uh, uh, conspiracies or, or deals that were going on to, to gather arms and ammunition or to supply the Continental Army. As uh, obviously the, the French alliance, uh, that's something talked about a great deal at Valley Forge, given that uh, news of the French alliance arrived during the encampment. Uh, but uh, I know a little bit about this, but I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. That's a good question. I'm not sure I know too much about it. Um... Well, wasn't there I mean, a Cuban emissary that uh, was trying to make his way over to, uh, uh, to to meet with Washington? That sounds familiar. I mean, I, I, I got to think of in terms of the dates in terms of where Washington is at these different points. Um, I also, I mean, I think Washington and um, George Rogers Clark are, you know, they're in, in communication and, and he's also engaged in his own campaigns in what we would call Upper Louisiana. Um, in the same place where these goods are flowing through up the Mississippi and then up the Ohio. Um, but it's, it's a good question. It's one I don't have a very good answer to. Um, I do believe, though, I, I know Washington knew of Galvez um, mm. and mentions him in correspondence. Uh, Juan de Morales, uh, he's a Spanish arms dealer. And uh, he eventually did meet with, with Washington at one point. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, it was sidelined with like... Uh, I don't know if it was a shipwreck or, <laughs> or just had to, to go into port, but uh, he wasn't able to make it up uh, to, uh, uh, to the Philadelphia area um, early on, uh, certainly not by the end of the uh, Belly Forge encampment. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there is that, that intrigue is going on a, a great deal. And uh, it's, it's interesting when you have these uh, arms dealers <laughs> that always seem to be at the center of it uh, starting off. It's very cloak and dagger. Yeah. And yeah. it would make a great movie, honestly. 
Yeah, and we do have the same thing with the French. Before the, the French uh, alliance, an actual treaty was brokered. There were similar sorts of, uh, you know, uh, backroom uh, deals of uh, weapons being shipped to America going on. Yeah. Well, I think that's about it for questions. Uh, I think this talk has been amazing. Uh, always to, to kind of decenter uh, our understanding of the American Revolution is uh, something that is, is beneficial. You know, to, to look at the global war, to recognize that this war didn't end with Yorktown in 1781, but takes much longer for a treaty uh, between Great Britain and the United States, and the fact that there have to be separate treaties made with uh, France and Spain as well before this a global conflict can uh, come to an end. I mean, I'll just add really quick. So my father's from Arkansas. There is a battle, there's a campaign at the, at the, the Arkansas Post in 1783 of all places. It's held That's by the nice. Spanish and you have these pro-British factions in that part of the world trying to route the Spanish out of this little tiny fort. So this is still like, news is slow to travel, but you know, some people really want to win something, so. Yeah, fascinating. So certainly uh, do look up uh, that book uh, you were recommending, Independence Lost uh, by Kathleen Duvall. And uh, Philippe Helbert, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.